It's called Daddy's Girl. It is gorgeous. Look at that. Now we're driving to a nursery to buy a plant that we're going to have to plant in the heat. Not in the heat. They bloom a little bit later than the bearded iris and the Siberian iris. So if edging. We've been working on edging all of our beds and our tree rings. And here we have some edging stones that I had purchased several years ago at Lowe's and I did like them initially, but over time your tastes kind of change and now I don't like them so much. And so we're removing them and we might use them in another spot in the garden. But this is a tree ring that we have around our Heritage River birch. And we had to edge this because there, over time there is grass that starts growing between the paved stones or the edging stones. So in order for us to edge this correctly, we would have to remove the stones anyway. So what we've done now is we're removing them, we're moving them, and we're just gonna leave a natural edge. We did the same thing over there on our patio bed. This week, we worked on edging that and getting it cleaned up. And we just had a really large pile of mulch delivered. And the timing is not ideal because we are having a heat wave. So we're just going to do little bits at a time over the next couple of days to get it all done. We're in my raised bed garden and when you come down the gravel path to this garden, it has become a weedy mess. Now it is a gravel path, but there's no underlayment underneath it. So it's a perfect breeding ground for weeds, especially when you get a lot of rain and um, the heat that we're getting. So I'm gonna mix up an all natural weed killer. Now I actually saw this recipe. I watch Becky from Acre Homestead sometimes and I caught one of her episodes where she was making a batch of natural weed killer to use in her gravel paths and walkways. And I thought that I would give it a shot today. So what you need to make this weed killer is white vinegar, salt and dish soap. So I'm gonna go ahead and mix it. I have a one gallon pump sprayer, so I'm gonna use an entire gallon of this white vinegar. So I'm gonna add my salt, which I need one cup of salt. And this is just regular table salt. There we are. Actually, I'm just gonna use the rest of this. It's pretty much a cup. Okay, so that's that. A quarter cup of dish soap. I have accidentally been calling it an all-natural weed killer, and it's actually a DIY weed killer because the recipe does include dish soap, which does have some additives in it. And now we'll add our vinegar. Now it's good to do weed killer like this on a hot, sunny day. And while the path is still a little bit shady, it's going to get really sunny pretty soon, in about an hour or so. And it's super hot right now, so I think it's a perfect day to work on this. Okay, I want to go spray the weeds, but there are a couple of things in this garden looking really pretty at the moment. So I thought that I would give you a quick update on how things are growing. And over here, you can see my stock is looking so beautiful. This was the first time that I grew stock from seed. Now these are a one and done flower, sort of like some varieties of sunflowers. And because it was my first time, I was really excited to see how nice they smelled. And I'm happy to report they have a really wonderful fragrance. And I have three varieties growing, alto red, um, a type of purple, I don't remember the name, and um, an alto apricot. I got them all, all of the seeds from Baker Creek, and they're absolutely beautiful. Sewing? These were sown under my grow lights. I grew them under my grow lights, and I grew about 60 of them, and I've already cut on these a few. Um, I cut a few out, and I made some floral arrangements to give to a couple of friends, and I've really enjoyed having those. Next year, though, I will try to grow um, a multi-branching variety so that I can plant less of them because space is kind of limited for me in this area. But I also have a couple of other things that are looking really pretty. Check out this aster. Look how pretty this is. It's so beautiful. This is the Janina salmon aster also from baker creek and it's still opening up you can tell that it's still going to unfurl but it's got such a beautiful color and i think it's going to look really nice with 
my dahlias and even the zinnias. The fever few in the front there is looking really nice. I grew this for a filler. So you can cut this and kind of add it to big flowers like that and it'll look really pretty together. I've already pinched my cosmos, so now it's starting to branch. And pinching just means cutting the um, flower at a certain point so that it'll encourage side shoots and then you'll get more blooms. But it does delay you getting blooms. So I've sacrificed some blooms in order to get more branching. And then in time, I will get even more blooms. And let me show you my first dahlia that just opened up. And it is a beauty. It's absolute perfection, actually, and I'm so in love with it. This is a variety called, now a friend gave this to me, and I don't think this is Crazy Legs. This is this variety. It's called Daddy's Girl. It is gorgeous. Look at that. So pretty. A gardening friend from my garden club actually um, had some extras that she had um, made some cuttings of, and... It was already a good sized plant when she gave it to me and I planted it. So that's why it's a lot further ahead than some of my other varieties. And this one here was another one that Genevieve had given me. And this one is called Cha Ching. And it's a beautiful one that almost looks like it has paint splashes on it. And there is one more burgundy colored one. Now burgundy is a new color for me with dahlias this year. Deep reds. Um, I'm giving those a try because I've started to really like those moody, dark colors. Look at this beauty. So gorgeous. And I'll get the name on that one in a second. I'm going to look for the tag. I tag these all and it starts out pretty well in the beginning of the season where you can read the tags, you can find them. And then as the season goes on and things get really wild in here, it gets a little bit harder to tell what's what. So that one is called Holly Hills Black Beauty is that one there. So pretty. I also am growing one called Rip City and Cornell, which I think are also going to be dark shades of red. And I'm excited to see what those look like. And my sweet peas are blooming. So here they are. George will come around the back so I can show you. Now you can see that this year I did a different type of gridding, which I'll show you in a second. But um, for my things to grow through, the supports for staking. But look at that. My very first sweet pea. I believe this one is called the Salmon Cream. Here is another one. I'm gonna take off a petal so that I can give it a sniff. I wanna see what they smell like. Oh, they, they smell nice. It's very nice. So that's fun. My first time growing sweet peas as well. What does it smell like? It smells like a sweet smell, like a, a flower. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Cool, right? Fun. And my marigolds, these are the um, sugar and spice, I believe. Let's see. Sugar and spice marigold. Look how beautiful these look. Everything is still really happy at this point in the season. They're blooming really well. I have some here at the end of this bed and also some right here behind at the end of this bed. So all in all, things are going really well in here. And someone had asked me, what I was doing to stake my dahlias this year. And last year I did fashion a, um, I kind of rigged up some staking with just some posts and some twine. But this year I went ahead and I bought some of this netting. It was fairly inexpensive and I just cut it to the size that I needed. And I hung it on some T-posts and I did kind of like a two-tier effect here because as the dahlias grow, they start needing more support, especially the taller ones. And I have most of the dinner plate size dahlias growing in this bed and those have really large blooms. And so they need the support and we get a lot of wind. And so with the wind, if I don't have support, that will knock over my dahlias and then they will crack and not bloom for me as well. So this seems to be working really well. I put it up before the dahlia started growing and you can see that they grow right through the grid and it's offering them some support. Some of them are still a little small, but um, in time they should all catch up. But when I came down here today, I was really excited to see that these dahlias have already started to bloom. So that is the benefit of starting dahlias ahead in pots. I just prefer not to do it that way because I would have to um, 
pot up a bunch of tubers. It takes a lot of soil. She had a greenhouse. Yep. It takes a lot of soil and it takes a lot of space. And I didn't have neither. I didn't want to spend the money on the soil. I didn't want to have to baby them for a couple of months. So I went this way. I just plant them directly in the ground. But the ones that she gave me as plants, you can see how far ahead they are. So there's definitely a benefit to potting up your dahlias and starting them in advance. You'll get blooms a lot sooner and you get to see pretty things like that faster. I'm on the path where I'm going to start spraying for weeds, but this is the climber that I planted here on my trellis this year, on my arbor. This is a Thunbergia or a Black Eyed Susan vine, and I found it in white, which I thought was really pretty. And my boys bought it for me for Mother's Day, so we went ahead and planted it to grow up this arbor. We put some fishing line in here because the arbor has such large gaps. Um, this way they have something else to attach to, the tendrils. I'm all done spraying my bottle of weed killer. So now we're gonna give it about a day and we'll come back and we'll see what things look like. While we're down here in my raised bed garden, I thought that I would install these solar lights that I ordered from Vigo when I ordered my new Vigo beds. And what's great about these is that they're magnetic and they're contoured, so they'll fit really nicely on the beds. So I'm gonna go ahead and just turn on the button and I'm gonna install it right in the center of this bed. And that's it. So we'll let them get charged throughout the day and then this evening we will come back and take a look at what things look like. I think it's going to provide really nice ambiance and light up this path here in this garden in the evenings. George, this is so good. There's no holes that I have to make in these beds so I can move them whenever I want. Yeah, so if you have indecision, no big deal. Yeah, no big deal. Not like hanging pictures in our house, right? It got too hot to work outside, so now we're driving to a nursery to buy a plant that we're going to have to plant in the heat. Not in the heat. Not in the heat. This guy hopped in the car pretty quickly for someone who doesn't like to yeah, garden. It's 95 degrees today. And humid. Yeah. We're at Sylvan Nursery in Westport, Massachusetts. They usually set up a bunch of plants on the way into the office where you check in. And as soon as you walk in, you'll already want to buy plants because they have such pretty things on display. Look at this smoke bush. What beautiful color it has, right? So vibrant. It's called the Grace Smoke Tree. So pretty. This is Dervilla. It's starting to bloom. The blooms almost look like honeysuckle. It's called uh, Kodiak Black. Oh, look, it does say that. Kodiak Black Bush Honeysuckle. Let me see if it smells. Mm, not too much. But these smell well. These are um, Budlias, the Pugster Blue by Proven Winners, and they actually smell like lilacs to me. They come in purple and white. The black lace elderberry that we can't keep in our garden without the deer eating it. But look how pretty, this one's in bloom. These are a really great option if you can't grow Japanese maple because these can take full sun. And they look really similar, the foliage, to some varieties of maples. Some pretty red cone flowers. Come and see these purple hydrangeas. They're so beautiful. And they look so gorgeous with this Hakanakloa or Japanese forest grass. And both of these like shade or part shade. So they'll do well in similar light exposure. It says morning sun, afternoon shade. Zones four through nine. This is the summer crush. Now the color of these hydrangeas are gonna depend on the pH in your soil. If you have more acidic soil, they'll lean more blue. And if you have more alkaline soil, they'll be purple or pink. We actually just saw some at the Home Depot that were more pink. These are more purple, but they look so beautiful with this yellow forest grass. All right, I'm gonna go check in and then we'll get to looking for some of the plants that I came for. I got my clipboard and my map, but as I was coming out of the office, check out this Brennera. Isn't that gorgeous? Usually you see them um, in a bluish color with some silvery flecks. And this one is green with this creamy yellow outer margin. Let's see what it's called. Right there, Siberian Bug Gloss Variegata. It looks so beautiful paired with this hydrangea. This is the Serrata type hydrangea or the lace cap hydrangea is called Tough Stuff. So pretty. Look at all these beautiful evergreens. The blues and the greens and the yellows. 
I'm actually looking for an evergreen to go on the side of our home where we have a hill um, where our foundation is kind of exposed. I had planted a uh, gray owl juniper a couple of years ago and it is beautiful. The juniper is growing really well but it has more of a horizontal growth habit and it's starting to overtake the space and crash into a mugo pine that I have. So I am on the hunt for a blue colored evergreen that will stay a bit more rounded and compact. So I'll see if I can find that. I also want to take a look at their yarrow um, achillea as well as maybe the coneflowers to see if I find a cool variety to add to my collection. This is actually what I came here looking for. It is a rounded shaped blue spruce. So this is called the Pisces Pungens Glauca Glubosa. But the only one that they have in stock is a bit misshapen. It looks like it's missing um, a main branch here in the center. You can see that there's sort of a wound. So I don't want to risk buying this because at the price point, it would be a bit of a risk. So I'm going to keep looking around and see if I find something that is blue that would be a good alternative for this shrub. I ended up speaking to someone who works here and when that Glauco Glubosa didn't work out, they recommended a Montgomery spruce. So I took a look at the Montgomery, which also has that blue color, but it has more of a conical kind of tree shape where it'll get a point eventually and be really chubby at the bottom. And I didn't really like the shape of it. But across the way, I found this one here, which is a Pisces Pungens Christina. And it's also a dwarf growth rate shrub. So it only grows one to six inches a year. And its full size will be about six feet tall by six feet wide. Also has this really beautiful blue color. So I'm still undecided, but this would be a good alternative option. Last week, I posted a garden tour of landscape designer Andrew Grossman's garden and next to his pool or in his pool garden, he had these beautiful pink roses. And this was actually the variety. It's the Queen Elizabeth rose. So pretty, nice and upright, and his were so healthy. They looked beautiful. I'm looking for coneflowers. I want to find pretty parasols or pink parasols. They're actually a white coneflower with a little bit of pink in the center. Um, and they're kind of hard to find. You can find them online, but I like to always buy plants in person if I can. So I'm checking here to see if I might find that variety. It's almost getting to be coneflower season. In just a couple more weeks, they're going to be in full bloom. Green Twister. I have this variety that I actually grew from seed. And I have the white swan that I also grew from seed and the Echinacea purpurea. So all three of those I was able to successfully grow from seed. And then I have the Pow Wow Wild Berry, which is a posh, uh, hot pink, like fuchsia color that I purchased as a plant. Um, but I really want to find the pink parasols. I believe that's the name of it. Yeah, I don't think they have it. Look how pretty that is, George. Oh, this is one of their shade houses. You can see it has shade cloth on it. And these are all hookahs, tiarellas, and shade plants, basically. This is one of my favorites right here. This is the caramel hookah. And I have this one in my garden. I absolutely love it. It goes through so many different color changes. It looks like this one might have been getting a little bit too much sun, um, but they usually can tolerate a good amount of sun, especially if they have proper moisture. But this is a really pretty one. It's probably the one that does the best in my garden is the caramel. All the other ones start to get a little bit small, but you can get lots of beautiful colors in a shade garden just with the use of foliage. So no luck on the coneflowers, but I'm also looking for yarrow or achillea. So I'm going to go see what varieties they might have. All right, here is all of their yarrow and this yellow one looks really beautiful. It's called Sunny Seduction and it has a really light buttery yellow color. And then there's this orange one. So all of the colors they have look like hot colors right now. So yellows, orange, terracotta, and even there are some red over here. So I'm three for three striking out today, but that happens sometimes. Every time we come to the nursery, um, we're not going to find what we want and we don't have to just buy plants because we came to the nursery. That's a lesson I've been trying to learn for the last several years. So if they don't have what I want, I will keep looking. But the good news is that I get to keep visiting nurseries in search of those perfect plants. So I did find a yarrow that is sort of in the pink family. It is called the Desert Eve Deep Rose. But it's not quite the right pink. Um, you can see that it looks more like a magenta, almost red. And I really had my heart set on a variety that I currently had in my garden that ended up just not coming back that well. It was called the Tutti Fruity Apricot Delight. It's more of a apricot pink kind of salmon color and it's gorgeous, but I haven't been able to find it yet this season.
So the search continues. Look at this gorgeous iris. This is a variety of iris called an iris ensada, and this one is called Lion King. I have a very similar variety in my garden, and it is gorgeous, and mine is just starting to open up. They have huge blooms, these beautiful shades of purple and white with some yellow. They're just so beautiful. They bloom a little bit later than the bearded iris and the Siberian iris. So if you really like iris, the Ensada is a good variety to add. So I came back to just make a final decision on a blue conifer. And I really do like the shape of the needles on this blue conifer, the Globosa, Glauca Globosa Picea pungens, much better than the Christina that I saw over there, which looks more like a pine to me, even though it's not. So the search continues. Um, it's a bummer that I'm going to go home without the shrub, but I also don't want to buy something just for the sake of buying something and not leaving empty handed. So that's it. Today was just not a nursery trip to buy plants. Next time. You know, we really love our Japanese maples because of all the colors, but check out the colors on this here. This is a red bud and this is called a flamethrower. Look at that. It is gorgeous. Has heart-shaped leaves and all of these really pretty colors, like colors of fire, right? Flamethrower, that's what it gets its name. It's gorgeous. Mm -hmm. I, I really love the shape of the leaves, the heart-shaped leaves. Huge. Really big leaves. Look at that. So pretty. This catches your eye as you drive in. I noticed it right away today. It's the next day and we're back at mulching. I was finishing up breakfast inside and George came out here and has already made some pretty good progress. So it is overcast today, which is much better than yesterday. We had just gotten a heat wave and uh, we had a thunderstorm that was a little bit unexpected come through last night and uh, it cooled things off quite a bit. So it'll be good to get some of this mulching done. We finished mulching the patio bed and it looks so good. There is just something about applying a fresh coat of mulch that really gives it such a nice finishing touch. It really makes our plants pop. Check out this uh, golden jubilee hyssop that I grew from seed last year. It came back this year and is looking really pretty. Nice bright chartreuse yellow and it's already starting to bud up. You can see right there and right here. My coneflowers, this is the double scoop raspberry, are starting to bloom. And I also have a bunch of zinnias that I planted in this middle section here. I had some uh, yarrow, some achillea, and it was the Rudy Tutti Fresh and, what was it called? Rudy Tutti Apricot Delight? Yes, that's what it was. It was a really beautiful color, but it ended up dying back because this is a pretty... Um, wet bed. This bed retains a lot of moisture. So now I have this whole middle section here that I can use to plant annuals. So I put a bunch of zinnias in there and I also just transplanted a ton of verbena bonariensis. You can see here I kind of stuck the verbena in between the zinnias. I have already pinched back the zinnias so they're starting to put out two side shoots which is going to be good because then it'll give me more blooms. So this bed is done. George has already moved to another bed. So we're gonna go ahead and check to see how he's doing. And here's what George has been working on. This is the side of our house that is on a hill and I don't love gardening in this spot because of the hill. It makes it really difficult. So what I did about three years ago was plant some evergreens and shrubs so that it would be really low maintenance and I wouldn't have to do much here. And at that point we did go ahead and mulch but because we didn't do anything since the edge got really overgrown and there was really no delineation between the bed and the lawn. So recently, um, George did go ahead and work with me on getting this edged, and I'm gonna insert some footage on what we did to get this line pretty straight. So what are we doing, George? So we know the foundation is perfectly straight, so all I'm going to do is measure off the foundation at the top and at the bottom, and I'm gonna string a line, and that's gonna be my reference for cutting this edge in.
we're making great progress with our edging, but I thought that we would take a second just to show you what our process is. We use this half moon edger that has a serrated edge and it works really well to cut into your sod. We then cut sections like George is showing there across so that we make it smaller, more manageable chunks to be able to lift those pieces of sod. And once we have those pieces cut out, we then go in with one of these flathead um, shovels. This is a spade to sort of slice underneath the sod. And we try to get it as thin as possible so that we're not losing too much of our soil. And then we can dispose of it. Or if you have another area in the garden that you need to patch up the grass, this would be a good option as well see and it comes out in more manageable pieces so that is how we edge so as you can see this bed had gotten pretty messy and definitely was in need of some work and so now we're mulching and you can see that there is some cardboard under the mulch there so what we're doing is because this spot i don't plan on planting in um, i want to keep the weeds down as long as possible so we're using my favorite type of cardboard for this application and for sheet mulching and that is four by four squares of pallet cardboard and back when we did our sheet mulching video i did say that this was a hooked and rooted exclusive and i i'm going to stand by that because i have not seen anyone else use this four by four perfect square of uh, pallet cardboard it has no holes no tape no staples it's awesome so if you can go to any of the large box store retailers and between the cases of water they usually have those they're more than willing to give it to you if you ask and it makes a really great underlayment under mulch especially for large expanses like this where you just want to put your mulch down and not worry about things and right here is the gray owl juniper that prompted that nursery trip yesterday. You can see that I've already kind of started to cut it back because it got really large. It was crashing into this beauty berry here and this nine bark that I have planted in this area. And it was also growing up and around and even over this Yugo pine. So it needed to be trimmed. I was hoping to find one of those um, Glubosa blue spruces, but I didn't find one that we could buy because the one that they had was damaged. So I'm just going to cut this one back, mulch around it, leave it for the year. And when I find a replacement, I'll go ahead and switch it out. Now, I will tell you that this gray owl juniper is a beautiful shrub. And if you have an application in your garden where you need something that is really wide, um, I would say this one got to be about 10 feet wide at this point, and it's only three years old. So I wasn't prepared for how fast it was going to grow and how much it grows horizontally, so how wide it gets. Um, but this, with the right application, is a beautiful shrub. It just was the wrong shrub for this particular spot. So this is going to be the before shot and I'm gonna go ahead and prune it and shape it up and then I will show you the after. All right, and here is the after. So I took off about two thirds of this shrub so far. Um, I did some the other day and then some more today. So now it's a nice manageable size. Let's take a look to see how the DIY weed killer is doing. And you can see that things have already started to die back. They are less green and starting to wilt. So that is good. We had mixed up the mixture of the salt and the dish soap with the white vinegar and sprayed it down. And while the day was supposed to be dry, we ended up having an unexpected thunderstorm about five or six hours after I sprayed the solution. So I'm happy to see that it did work. And had it been a drier day, it probably would have looked even better. So pretty happy with the results and I will certainly be using it again. Well, this is as far as we have gotten. We still need to pick up some more cardboard so that we can finish mulching this side of the house. But we have been out here all morning and mulching is such hard work. So we're pretty tired. I think this is a good stopping point and we'll call it done for today. It is now Sunday and I've been hanging out with you for three days in this video. So today I happened to walk by this area here in this newly created garden room and I noticed that the iris that I had showed you at the nursery yesterday is now blooming in my garden today. So this is an iris and sada and my variety is called tiramisu. The one that we saw at the nursery was called Lion King, but they are so similar. I had purchased these as uh, rhizomes that came in a bag from Longfield Gardens as bare roots and I planted them in here about three years ago now and these are absolutely beautiful and they come up usually every year first week of July and here we are in the last week or so of June and um, everything in the garden is a little bit ahead this year but they're really pretty and I wanted to share them with you. So that is it for this video. Thank you so much for spending your time with us and I'll catch you in the next one. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, please hit the thumbs up button. 
and please consider subscribing so you don't miss any of my future videos. And we'll see you soon.